Hey guys, Shaber 1000 here. If we have any Elvis Presley fans out there, you'll probably know what today is. But for those of you that don't know, today is the anniversary of Elvis's death. He passed away in 1977 on this date, August 16th. He's been gone 42 years. And he was 42 years old when he passed away. So, I decided to make this video uh, in honor of him. Now, I won't be able to play any of his music, as we all know, in the video. But I will uh, put some pictures up and I will have a narrative of just a little bit about about his life. and uh, But not all of it. There's... By no means I could do I couldn't do all of it, but I, I will put a link in the description below of the article that I got this from, and uh, it's very interesting. And that way you can read the article in more depth. So it's kind of you know skips over, but it touches on some things uh, you know about his life and his death. So um, you know I appreciate you guys watching, and uh, hope we, hopefully we've got some Elvis fans out there and. Um, so, just wanted to do this kind of in remembrance of him, you know. I mean, uh, I've always been an Elvis fan. My youngest daughter is an Elvis fan. Uh, my oldest daughter is an Elvis fan. So, of course, me. Um, so, you know, I just want to say again, thanks for watching. And please enjoy the photos. I will have some background music playing. But, again, I'm sorry. But I can't, I can't use his music. But... There'll be some interesting pictures and uh, also some very interesting narrative. So sit back and enjoy the narrative and enjoy the photos. Thanks for watching. Elvis Aaron Presley was born to Vernon and Gladys Presley in a two-room house in Tupelo, Mississippi, on January 8, 1935. His twin brother, Jesse Garon, was stillborn, leaving Elvis to grow up as an only child. Elvis and his parents moved to Memphis, Tennessee, in 1948, and Elvis graduated from Humes High School there in 1953. Elvis' musical influences were the pop and country music of the time, the gospel music he heard in church and at the all-night gospel sings he frequently attended, and the black R&B he absorbed on historic Beale Street as a Memphis teenager. In 1954, Elvis began his singing career with the legendary Sun Records label in Memphis. In late 1955, his recording contract was sold to RCA Victor. By 1956, he was an international sensation. With the sound and style that uniquely combined Elvis' diverse musical influences and blurred and challenged the social and racial barriers of the time, he ushered in a whole new era of American music and popular culture. Elvis Presley's dynamic life story from his humble beginnings through his rise through stardom is a fascinating journey which has earned Elvis's still undefeated title of the king of rock and roll. His songs are unforgettable, they have stood the test of time, especially his singles of the 1950s, a decade in which he had a song at number one. For a full six months of that year, an even more incredible statistic is Elvis only started at RCA in January of 1956, there is only two years until he is drafted into the US Army, he made four movies during this time. A testament to his incredible breakthrough is the fact that he managed to sell twice as many records in the entire decade of the 1950s with only these two years of recording than any other performer. There were also the Sun years 1954 to 1955 but these were not huge full record sales like when he became a national sensation in 1956 they were also unpredictable. Who could know what the next one would be like? Elvis liberally altered his style to suit each song. There were the early country boy rockabee sung in a breathless high pitch, of which My Baby Left Me, Milk of Blues Boogie and Money Honey are examples. His more mature, aggressive rock and roll stance came out with songs such as Blue Suede Shoes, One Night and A Big Hunk of Love. His approach to ballads ranged from the ethereal vocal effects on the guitar taping version of Blue Moon to smooth crooning on As Long As I Have You, Can't Help Falling In Love and many other slow numbers and movie songs. On Elvis' 11th birthday, his parents bought him a guitar. With the help of his uncle Johnny, Smith, 
and Pastor Frank Smith of the Assembly of God Church, which the Presleys were now attending, he learned some basic chords. However while Elvis did play rhythm in the 1950s he never progressed further as a guitar player, content to let the guitar become more of a prop as time went on. When you have a voice as good as Elvis Presley's, you are not motivated to learn more. Instead he concentrated on improving his voice to get it where he wanted, to be able to sing the bigger songs, like Are You Lonesome Tonight? It's Now or Never, both from 1960 and songs such as My Way in the 1970s just to name but a few. Soon after Elvis graduated in June of 1953, he began to explore the possibilities of singing professionally. In July, he went to 706 Union Avenue, a facility owned and run by Sam Phillips, where you could walk in and, for the amount of $3.98, record a two-sided record of your own performance. Elvis chose my happiness and that's when your heartaches begin. Amazingly both tracks and his follow-up recording in July 1954 of I'll Never Stand In Your Way, It Wouldn't Be The Same without you, survived and are available on CD to this day. Biographer Peter Gurlnick argues that he chose Sun in the hope of being discovered. Asked by receptionist Marion Xker what kind of singer he was, Elvis responded, I sing all kinds. When she pressed him on whom he sounded like, he repeatedly answered, I don't sound like nobody. After he recorded, Sun boss Sam Phillips asked Xker to note down the young man's name, which she did along with her own commentary, Good Ballad Singer. Hold. Elvis cut a second acetate in January 1954, I'll never stand in your way and it wouldn't be the same without you, but again nothing came of it. Not long after, he failed an audition for a local vocal quartet, the Sun Fellows. He explained to his father, they told me I couldn't sing. Song fellow Jim Hamill later claimed that he was turned down because he did not demonstrate an ear for harmony at the time. In April, Elvis began working for the Crown Electric Company as a truck driver. His friend Ronnie Smith, after playing a few local gigs with him, suggested he contact Eddie Bond, leader of Smith's professional band, which had an opening for a vocalist. Bond allegedly rejected him after a tryout, advising Elvis to stick to truck driving because you're never going to make it as a singer. Then Sam Phillips received a song from Nashville music publisher Sam Wortham, the same person who had delivered Just Walking in the Rain, Sun's first big hit record, The Prisoners, Sun 186. Phillips heard something in this new song, but he couldn't find the singer on the demo. So he finally decided that it just might fit the young man that Marion had kept reminding him about. The song was called Without You, a heartfelt, but unexceptional ballad. The date, June 26, 1954, Marion phoned Elvis asking if he could come down to the studio. Elvis later said he ran all the way. But Elvis just couldn't get it right. This could have been the final rejection, the ultimate disappointment, if not for Sam's belief in raw talent and how to uncover it. He invited Elvis to sing everything he knew. Although just shop-worn ballads were presented to him, Phillips did not make a final decision on the boy. Sam talked about it with Scotty Moore, guitarist in the group The Starlight Triangulars. Sam told Scotty to check Elvis out and gave him Elvis' phone number. On July 4, 1956 Salvis went over to Scotty Moore's house to sing with Scotty and Bill Black to see what Elvis could do. Bobby Moore, Scotty's wife says he had a good voice and they sang a lot of songs like I Love You Because, eventually to become the second song professionally recorded and released on Elvis' first RCA LP, Elvis Presley. When Elvis left, Scotty and Bill discussed the proceedings, Bill turned to Scotty and looked at him kind of funny, what do you think of him? Scotty said, well, he's got a good voice, good singer, if we can find the right material. So he called Sam and Sam said, you got the next night to rehearse, at Sun. July 5th, as agreed, Elvis, Scotty, and Bill arrived at the Sun studio after work. Sam went into the control room. The threesome continued, as they had done at Scotty's house, with what was basically a recap of artists like Eddie Arnold, Hank Snow and Ink Spots. The first documented song was Harbor Lights, 
a number one hit in 1950 for Sammy Kay and his orchestra, but covered instantly by Bing Crosby. The evening's defining moment came after four shaky attempts at Leon Payne's 1949 country hit, I Love You Because. It was during a break that Arthur Big Boy Crudup's That's All Right materialized. The trio played publicly for the first time on July 17th at the Bon Air Club, Elvis still sporting his child-size guitar. At the end of the month, they appeared at the Overton Park Shell, with Slim Whitman headlining. A combination of his strong response to rhythm and nervousness at playing before a large crowd led Elvis to shake his legs as he performed, his wide-cut pants emphasized his movements, causing young women in the audience to start screaming. Moore called, during the instrumental parts he would back off from the mic and be playing and shaking, and the crowd would just go wild. Black, a natural showman, whooped and rode his bass hitting double licks that Elvis would later remember as really a wild sound, like a jungle drum or something. Soon after, Moore and Black quit their old band to play with Elvis regularly, and promoter Bob Neal became the trio's manager. From August through October, they played frequently at the Eagles Nest Club and returned to Sun Studio for more recording sessions, and Elvis quickly grew more confident on stage. According to Moore, his movement was a natural thing, but he was also very conscious of what got to reaction. He'd do something one time and then he would expand on it real quick. Elvis made what would be his only appearance on Nashville's Grand Ole Opry on October 2nd, after a polite audience response, Opry manager Jim Denny told Phillips that his singer was not bad but did not suit the program. Two weeks later, Elvis was booked on Louisiana Hayride, the Opry's chief, and more adventurous, rival. The Shreveport-based show was broadcast to 198 radio stations in 28 states. Elvis had another attack of nerves during the first set, which drew a muted reaction. A more composed and energetic second set inspired an enthusiastic response. House drummer DJ Fontana brought a new element, complementing Elvis' movements with accented beats that he had mastered playing in strip clubs. Soon after the show, the Hayride engaged Elvis for a year's worth of Saturday night appearances. Trading in his old guitar for $8, and seeing it promptly dispatched to the garbage, he purchased a Martin instrument for $175, and his trio began playing in new locales including Houston, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas. In October DJ Fontana was hired to play drums for Elvis. Using a very bare-bones drum kit, DJ sat behind the curtain, unseen by the audience, and played behind Elvis and the boys as they performed the two songs allotted them, which were That's Alright Mama, and possibly, DJ's memory was a little sketchy, Blue Moon of Kentucky. By early 1955, Elvis' regular hayride appearances, constant touring, and well-received record releases had made him a substantial regional star, from Tennessee to West Texas. In January, Neil signed a formal management contract with Elvis and brought the singer to the attention of Colonel Tom Parker, whom he considered the best promoter in the music business. Parker, Dutch-born, though he claimed to be from West Virginia, had acquired an honorary colonel's commission from country singer turned Louisiana Governor Jimmy Davis. Having successfully managed top country star Reddy Arnold, he was now working with the new number one country singer, Hank Snow. Parker booked Elvis on Snow's February tour. When the tour reached Odessa, Texas, a 19-year-old Roy Oberbison saw Elvis for the first time, his energy was incredible, his instinct was just amazing, I just didn't know what to make of it. There was just no reference point in the culture to compare it. On March 24, 1958, Elvis was inducted into the U.S. Army as a private at Fort Chaffee, near Fort Smith, Arkansas. Captain Arlie Metheny, the information officer, was unprepared for the media attention drawn by the singer's arrival. Hundreds of people descended on Elvis as he stepped from the bus, photographers then accompanied him into the base. Elvis announced that he was looking forward to his military stint, saying he did not want to be treated any differently from anyone else, the army can do anything it wants with me. Later, at Fort Hood, Texas, Lt. Col. Marjorie Shelton gave the media carte blanche for one day, after which she declared Elvis off-limits to the press. 
Soon after Elvis had commenced basic training at Fort Hood, he received a visit from Eddie Fiddle, a businessman he had met when on tour in Texas. Fiddle reported that Elvis had become convinced his career was finished, he firmly believed that. During a two-week leave in early June, Elvis cut five sides in Nashville. He returned to training, but in early August his mother was diagnosed with hepatitis and her condition worsened. Elvis was granted emergency leave to visit her, arriving in Memphis on August 12. Two days later, Gladys died of heart failure, aged 46. Elvis was devastated, the relationship had remained extremely close, even into his adulthood, they would use baby talk with each other and Elvis would address her with pet names. After training at Fort Hood, Elvis joined the 3rd Armored Division in Freiburg, Germany, on October 1. The Army also introduced Elvis to karate, which he studied seriously, later including it in his live performances. Fellow soldiers have attested to Elvis' wish to be seen as an able, ordinary soldier, despite his fame, and to his generosity while in the service. He donated his army pay to charity, purchased TV sets for the base, and bought an extra set of fatigues for everyone in his outfit. While in Friedberg, Elvis met 14-year-old Priscilla Bewley. They would eventually marry after a seven-and-a-half-year courtship. In her autobiography, Priscilla says that despite his worries that it would ruin his career, Parker convinced Elvis that to gain popular respect, he should serve his country as a regular soldier rather than in special services, where he would have been able to give some musical performances and remain in touch with the public. Media reports echo Elvis' concerns about his career, but RCA producer Steve Scholes and Freddie Bean's Tuck of Hill and Range had carefully prepared for his two-year hiatus. Armed with a substantial amount of unreleased material, they kept up a regular stream of successful releases. Between his induction and discharge, Elvis had 10 top 40 hits, including Wear My Ring Around Your Neck, The Best Selling Hard-Headed Woman, and One Night in 1958, and, now and then there's, a fool such as I and the number one A Big Hunk A Love in 1959. RCA also managed to generate four albums compiling old material during this period, most successfully Elvis Golden Records, 1958, which hit number three on the LP chart. Elvis returned to the United States on March 2, 1960, and was honorably discharged with the rank of sergeant on March 5. The train that carried him from New Jersey to Tennessee was mobbed all the way, and Elvis was called upon to appear at scheduled stops to please his fans. Back in Memphis, he wasted no time in returning to the studio. Sessions in March and April yielded two of his best-selling singles, the ballads It's Now or Never and Are You Lonesome Tonight? And Elvis is back. The album features several songs described by Gro Marcus as full of Chicago blues menace, driven by Elvis' own super acoustic guitar, brilliant playing by Scotty Moore, and demonic sax work from Boots Randolph. Elvis' singing wasn't sexy, it was pornographic. Shortly before Christmas 1966, more than seven years since they first met, Elvis proposed to Priscilla Bewley. Elvis Presley video they were married on May 1, 1967, in a brief ceremony and their suite at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. The flow of formulaic movies and assembly line soundtracks rolled on. It was not until October 1967, when the Clambake soundtrack LP registered record low sales for a new Elvis album, that RCA executives recognized the problem. By then, of course, the damage had been done, as historians Connie Kirkberg and Mark Hendricks put it. Elvis was viewed as a joke by serious music lovers and a has been to all but his most loyal fans. MGM again filmed Elvis in April 1972, this time for Elvis on tour, which went on to win the Golden Globe Award for Best Documentary Film that year. His gospel album He Touched Me, released that month, would earn him his second Grammy Award, for Best Inspirational Performance. A 14-day tour commenced with an unprecedented four consecutive sold-out shows at New York's Madison Square Garden. The evening concert on July 10 was recorded and issued in LP form a week later. Elvis, as recorded at Madison Square Garden became one of Elvis' biggest-selling albums. After the tour, the single Burning Love was released, 
Elvis' last top 10 hit on the US pop chart. The most exciting single Elvis has made since All Shook Up, wrote rock critic Robert Price Day. Who else could make its coming closer? The flames are now licking my body sound like an assignation with James Brown's backup band. Elvis and his wife, meanwhile, had become increasingly distant, barely cohabiting. The Presleys separated on February 23, 1972, after Priscilla disclosed her relationship with Mike Stone, a karate instructor Elvis had recommended to her. Five months later, Elvis' new girlfriend, Linda Thompson, a songwriter and one-time Memphis beauty queen, moved in with him. Elvis and his wife filed for divorce on August 18. In January 1973, Elvis performed two benefit concerts for the Kuali Cancer Fund in connection with the groundbreaking TV special, Aloha from Hawaii. The first show served as a practice run and backup should technical problems affect the live broadcast two days later. Aired is scheduled on January 14, Aloha from Hawaii was the first global concert satellite broadcast reaching approximately 1.5 billion viewers live and on tape delay. Elvis' costume became the most recognized example of the elaborate concert garb with which his latter-day persona became closely associated. As described by Bobby Ann Mason, at the end of the show, when he spreads out his American Eagle cape, with the full-stretched wings of the eagle studded on the back, he becomes a god figure. The accompanying double album, released in February, went to number one and eventually sold over 5 million copies in the United States. It proved to be Elvis' last U.S. number one pop album during his lifetime. At a midnight show the same month, four men rushed onto the stage in an apparent attack. Security men leapt to Elvis' defense, and the singer's karate instinct took over as he ejected one invader from the stage himself. Elvis' divorce took effect on October 9, 1973. He was now becoming increasingly unwell. On July 13, 1976, Vernon Presley, who had become deeply involved in his son's financial affairs, fired Memphis Mafia bodyguards Red West, Elvis' friends since the 1950s, Sonny West, and David Herbuller, citing the need to cut back on expenses. Elvis was in Palm Springs at the time. An associate of Elvis, John O'Grady, argued that the bodyguards were dropped because their rough treatment of fans had prompted too many lawsuits. Elvis and Linda Thompson split in November, and he took up with a new girlfriend, Ginger Alden. He proposed to Alden and gave her an engagement ring two months later, though several of his friends later claimed that he had no serious intention of marrying again. RCA which had enjoyed a steady stream of product from Elvis for over a decade, grew anxious as his interest in spending time in the studio waned. After a December 1973 session that produced 18 songs, enough for almost two albums, he did not enter the studio in 1974. Parker sold RCA on another concert record, Elvis, as recorded live on stage in Memphis. Recorded on March 20, it included a version of How Great Thou Art that would win Elvis his third and final competitive Grammy Award. All three of his competitive Grammy wins, out of 14 total nominations, were for gospel recordings. Elvis returned to the studio in Hollywood in March 1975, recording 10 songs that would form the Elvis Today album, his last studio album. But Parker's attempts to arrange another session toward the end of the year were unsuccessful. In 1976, RCA sent a mobile studio to Graceland that made possible two full-scale recording sessions at Elvis' home. Even in that comfortable context, the recording process was now a struggle for him. For all the concerns of his label and manager, in studio sessions between July 1973 and October 1976, Elvis recorded virtually the entire contents of six albums. Though he was no longer a major presence on the pop charts, five of those albums entered the top five of the country chart, and three went to number one, Promised Land, 1975, from Elvis Presley Boulevard, Memphis, Tennessee, 1976, and Moody Blue, 1977. Elvis Presley died at Graceland on August 16, 1977. He was 42 years old.
through the early morning of the 16th Elvis took care of last minute tour details and relaxed with family and staff. He was to fly to Portland, Maine that night and do a show there on the 17th, then continue the scheduled tour. Elvis retired to his master suite at Graceland around 7 a.m. to rest for his evening flight. By late morning, Elvis Presley had died of heart failure. In a matter of hours the shock registered around the world.